Book Eight, Chapters Twelve and Thirteen of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume Two, Chapter Twelve: How Zera, King of the Ethiopians, was beaten by Asa, and how Asa, upon Baasha's making war against him, invited the king of the Damascus to assist him, and how, on the destruction of the house of Baasha, Zimri got the kingdom, as did his son Ahab after him. Now Asa, the king of Jerusalem, was of an excellent character, and had a regard to God, and neither did nor designed anything but what had relation to the observation of the laws. He made a reformation of his kingdom, and cut off whatsoever was wicked therein, and purified it from every impurity. Now he had an army of chosen men that were armed with targets and spears, out of the tribe of Judah three hundred thousand, and out of the tribe of Benjamin, that bore shields and drew bows, two hundred and fifty thousand. But when he had already reigned ten years, Zerah, king of Ethiopia, made an expedition against him with a great army of nine hundred thousand footmen, and one hundred thousand horsemen, and three hundred chariots, and came as far as Marisha, a city that belonged to the tribe of Judah. Now when Zerah had passed so far with his own army, Asa met him and put his army in array over against him, in a valley called Zephatha, not far from the city. And when he saw the multitude of the Ethiopians, he cried out and besought God to give him the victory, and that he might kill many ten thousands of the enemy. For, said he, I depend on nothing else but that assistance which I expect from thee, which is able to make the fewer superior to the more numerous, and the weaker to the stronger, and thence it is alone that I venture to meet Zerah and fight him. While Asa was saying this, God gave him a signal of victory, and joining battle cheerfully on account of what God had foretold about it, he slew a great many of the Ethiopians, and when he had put them to flight, he pursued them to the country of Gerar, and when they left off killing their enemies, they betook themselves to spoiling them, for the city Gerar was already taken, and to spoiling their camp, so that they carried off much gold and much silver, and a great deal of other prey, and camels, and great cattle, and flocks of sheep. Accordingly, when Asa and his army had obtained such a victory, and such wealth from God, they returned to Jerusalem, now as they were coming, a prophet whose name was Azariah met them on the road, and bade them stop their journey a little, and began to say to them thus, that the reason why they had obtained this victory from God was this, that they had showed themselves righteous and religious men, and had done everything according to the will of God, that therefore, he said, if they persevered therein, God would grant that they should always overcome their enemies and live happily. But if they left off his worship, all things shall fall out on the contrary. And a time should come, wherein no true prophet shall be left in your whole multitude, nor a priest who shall deliver you a true answer from the oracle. But your cities shall be overthrown, and your nation scattered over the whole earth, and live the life of strangers and wanderers. So he advised them, while they had time, to be good, and not to deprive themselves of the favor of God. When the king and the people heard this, they rejoiced, and all in common, and every one in particular, took great care to behave themselves righteously. The king also sent some to take care that those in the country should observe the laws also. And this was the state of Asa, king of the two tribes. I now return to Baasha, the king of the multitude of the Israelites, who slew Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, and retained the government. He dwelt in the city Tirzah, having made that his habitation, and reigned twenty-four years. He became more wicked and impious than Jeroboam or his son. He did a great deal of mischief to the multitude, and was injurious to God, who sent the prophet Jehu, and told him beforehand that his whole family should be destroyed, and that he would bring the same miseries on his house which had brought that of Jeroboam to ruin, because when he had been made king by him, 
he had not requited his kindness by governing the multitude righteously and religiously, which things, in the first place, tended to their own happiness, and, in the next place, were pleasing to God, that he had imitated this very wicked King Jeroboam, and although that man's soul had perished, yet did he express to the life his wickedness. And he said that he should therefore justly experience the like calamity with him, since he had been guilty of the like wickedness. But Basha, though he heard beforehand what miseries would befall him and his whole family for their insolent behavior, yet did not he leave off his wicked practices for the time to come, nor did he care to appear other than worse and worse till he died. Nor did he then repent of his past actions, nor endeavor to obtain pardon of God for them, but did as those do who have rewards proposed to them. When they have once in earnest set about their work, they do not leave off their labors. For thus did Basha, when the prophet foretold to him what would come to pass, grow worse, as if what were threatened, the perdition of his family and the destruction of his house, which are really among the greatest of evils, were good things, and, as if he were a combatant for wickedness, he every day took more and more pains for it, and at last he took his army and assaulted a certain considerable city called Ramah, which was forty furlongs distant from Jerusalem, and when he had taken it, he fortified it, having determined beforehand to leave a garrison in it, that they might thence make excursions and do mischief to the kingdom of Asa. Whereupon Asa was afraid of the attempts the enemy might make upon him, and considering with himself how many mischiefs this army that was left in Ramah might do to the country over which he reigned, he sent ambassadors to the king of the Damascenes with gold and silver, desiring his assistance, and putting him in mind that we have had a friendship together from the times of our forefathers. So he gladly received that sum of money and made a league with him, and broke the friendship he had with Basha, and sent the commanders of his own forces unto the cities that were under Basha's dominion, and ordered them to do them mischief. So they went and burnt some of them, and spoiled others, Ejon and Dan, and Abelmain, and many others. Now when the king of Israel heard this, he left off building and fortifying Ramah, and returned presently to assist his own people under the distresses they were in. But Asa made use of the materials that were prepared for building that city, for building in the same place two strong cities, the one of which was called Geba, and the other Mizpah, so that after this Basha had no leisure to make expeditions against Asa, for he was prevented by death, and was buried in the city Tirzah. And Elah his son took the kingdom, who, when he had reigned two years, died, being treacherously slain by Zimri, the captain of half his army. For when he was at Arza, his steward's house, he persuaded some of the horsemen that were under him to assault Elah, and by that means he slew him when he was without his armed men and his captains, for they were all busied in the siege of Gibbethon, a city of the Philistines. When Zimri, the captain of his army, had killed Elah, he took the kingdom himself, and, according to Jehu's prophecy, slew all the house of Basha. For it came to pass that Basha's house utterly perished, on account of his impiety, in the same manner as we have already described the destruction of the house of Jeroboam. But the army that was besieging Gibbethon, when they heard what had befallen the king, and that when Zimri had killed him he had gained the kingdom, they made Omri their general king who drew off his army from Gibbethon, and came to Tirzah, where the royal palace was, and assaulted the city, and took it by force. But when Zimri saw that the city had none to defend it, he fled into the inmost part of the palace, and set it on fire, and burnt himself with it, when he had reigned only seven days. Upon which the people of Israel were presently divided, and part of them would have Tibni to be king, and part Omri. But when those who were for Omri's ruling had beaten Tibni, Omri reigned over all the multitude. Now it was in the thirtieth year of the reign of Asa that Omri reigned for twelve years, 
Six of these years he reigned in the city Tirza, and the rest in the city called Semareon, but named by the Greeks Samaria. But he himself called it Semareon from Semer, who sold him the mountain whereon he built it. Now Omri was no way different from those kings that reigned before him, but that he grew worse than they, for they all sought how they might turn the people away from God by their daily wicked practices. And on that account it was that God made one of them to be slain by another, and that no one person of their families should remain. This Omri also died in Samaria, and Ahab his son succeeded him. Now by these events we may learn what concern God hath for the affairs of mankind, and how he loves good men and hates the wicked, and destroys them root and branch. For many of these kings of Israel, they and their families, were miserably destroyed, and taken away one by another in a short time, for their transgression and wickedness. But Asa, who was king of Jerusalem, and of the two tribes, attained by God's blessing a long and blessed old age, for his piety and righteousness, and died happily when he had reigned forty and one years. And when he was dead, his son Jehoshaphat succeeded him in the government. He was son of Asa's wife, Azubah. And all men allowed that he followed the works of David his forefather, and this both in courage and piety. But we are not obliged now to speak any more of the affairs of this king. Chapter 13 How Ahab, when he had taken Jezebel to wife, became more wicked than all the kings that had been before him. Of the actions of the prophet Elijah, and what befell Naboth. Now Ahab the king of Israel dwelt in Samaria, and held the government for twenty-two years and made no alteration in the conduct of the kings that were his predecessors, but only in such things as were of his own invention for the worse, and in his most gross wickedness. He imitated them in their wicked courses, and in their injurious behavior towards God, and more especially he imitated the transgression of Jeroboam, for he worshipped the heifers that he had made, and he contrived other absurd objects of worship besides those heifers. He also took to wife the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Tyrians and Sidonians, whose name was Jezebel, of whom he learned to worship her own gods. This woman was active and bold, and fell into so great a degree of impurity and madness, that she built a temple to the god of the Tyrians, which they call Belus, and planted a grove of all sorts of trees. She also appointed priests and false prophets to this god. The king also himself had many such about him, and so exceeded in madness and wickedness all the kings that went before him. There was now a prophet of God Almighty of Thespon, a country in Gilead, that came to Ahab and said to him that God foretold he would not send rain nor dew in those years upon the country, but when he should appear. And when he had confirmed this by an oath, he departed into the southern parts, and made his abode by a brook, out of which he had water to drink. For as for his food, ravens brought it to him every day. But when that river was dried up for want of rain, he came to Zarephath, a city not far from Sidon and Tyre, for it lay between them, and this at the command of God. For God told him that he should there find a woman who was a widow that should give him sustenance. So when he was not far off the city, he saw a woman that labored with her own hands, gathering of sticks. So God informed him that this was the woman who was to give him sustenance. So he came and saluted her, and desired her to bring him some water to drink. But as she was going so to do, he called to her, and would have her to bring him a loaf of bread also. Whereupon she affirmed upon oath that she had at home nothing more than one handful of meal and a little oil, and that she was going to gather some sticks, that she might knead it and make bread for herself and her son. After which, she said, they must perish, and be consumed by the famine, for they had nothing for themselves any longer. Hereupon he said, Go on with good courage, and hope for better things, and first of all make me a little cake, and bring it to me, for I foretell to thee that this vessel of meal and this cruise of oil 
shall not fail until God send rain. When the prophet had said this, she came to him and made him the before-named cake, of which she had part for herself, and gave the rest to her son, and to the prophet also. Nor did anything of this fail until the drought ceased. Now Menander mentions this drought in his account of the acts of Ethbaal, king of the Tyrians, where he says thus, Under him there was a want of rain from the month Hyperberitmus till the month Hyperberitmus of the year following. But when he made supplications there came great thunders. This Ethbaal built the city Botrys in Phoenicia, and the city Auza in Libya. By these words he designed the want of rain that was in the days of Ahab, for at that time it was that Ethbaal also reigned over the Tyrians, as Menander informs us. Now this woman, of whom we spake before, that sustained the prophet, when her son was fallen into a distemper till he gave up the ghost, and appeared to be dead, came to the prophet weeping and beating her breasts with her hands, and sending out such expressions as her passions dictated to her, and complained to him that he had come to her to reproach her for her sins, and that on this account it was that her son was dead. But he bid her be of good cheer, and deliver her son to him, for that he would deliver him again to her alive. So when she had delivered her son up to him, he carried him to an upper room where he himself lodged, and laid him down upon the bed, and cried to God, and said, that God had not done well in rewarding the woman who had entertained him and sustained him by taking away her son. And he prayed that he would send again the soul of the child into him, and bring him to life again. Accordingly, God took pity on the mother, and was willing to gratify the prophet, that he might not seem to have come to her to do her a mischief, and the child, beyond all expectation, came to life again. So the mother returned the prophet thanks, and said she was then clearly satisfied that God did converse with him. After a little while, Elijah came to King Ahab, according to God's will, to inform him that rain was coming. Now the famine had seized upon the whole country, and there was a great want of what was necessary for sustenance, insomuch that it was after the recovery of the widow's son of Sarepta, God sent not only men that wanted it, but the earth itself also, which did not produce enough for the horse and the other beasts of what was useful for them to feed on, by reason of the drought. So the king called for Obadiah, who was steward over his cattle, and said to him that he would have him go to the fountains of water and to the brooks, that if any herbs could be found for them, they might mow it down and reserve it for the beasts. And when he had sent persons all over the habitable earth to discover the prophet Elijah, and they could not find him, he bade Obadiah accompany him. So it was resolved that they should make a progress, and divide the ways between them, and Obadiah took one road and the king another. Now it happened that the same time when Queen Jezebel slew the prophets, that this Obadiah had hidden a hundred prophets, and had fed them with nothing but bread and water. But when Obadiah was alone and absent from the king, the prophet Elijah met him, and Obadiah asked him who he was, and when he had learned it from him, he worshipped him. Elijah then bid him go to the king, and tell him that I am here ready to wait on him. But Obadiah replied, What evil have I done to thee, that thou sendest me to one who seeketh to kill thee, and hath sought over all the earth for thee? Or was he so ignorant as not to know that the king had left no place untouched, under which he had not sent persons to bring him back, in order, if they could take him, to have him put to death? For he told him he was afraid lest God should appear to him again, and he should go away into another place, and that when the king should send him for Elijah, and he should miss of him, and not be able to find him anywhere upon earth, he should be put to death. He desired him therefore to take care of his preservation, and told him how diligently he had provided for those of his own profession, and had saved a hundred prophets, when Jezebel slew the rest of them, and had kept them concealed, and that they had been sustained by him. But Elijah bade him fear nothing but go to the king, and he assured him upon oath, 
that he would certainly show himself to Ahab that very day. So when Obadiah had informed the king that Elijah was there, Ahab met him and asked him in anger if he were the man that afflicted the people of the Hebrews, and was the occasion of the drought they lay under. But Elijah, without any flattery, said that he was himself the man, he and his house, which brought such sad afflictions upon them, and that by introducing strange gods into their country, and worshipping them, and by leaving their own, who was the only true God, and having no manner of regard to him. However, he bade him go his way, and gather together all the people to him to Mount Carmel, with his own prophets and those of his wife, telling him how many there were of them, as also the prophets of the groves, about four hundred in number. And as all the men whom Ahab sent for ran away to the forenamed mountain, the prophet Elijah stood in the midst of them and said, How long will you live thus in uncertainty of mind and opinion? He also exhorted them, that in case they esteemed their own country God to be the true and only God, they would follow him and his commandments. But in case they esteemed him to be nothing, but had an opinion of the strange gods, and that they ought to worship them, his counsel was that they should follow them. And when the multitude made no answer to what he said, Elijah desired that, for a trial of the power of the strange gods, and of their own god, he, who was his only prophet, while they had four hundred, might take a heifer and kill it as a sacrifice, and lay it upon pieces of wood, and not kindle any fire, and that they should do the same things, and call upon their own gods to set the wood on fire. For if that were done, they would thence learn the nature of the true God. This proposal pleased the people. So Elijah bade the prophets to choose out a heifer first, and kill it, and to call on their gods. But when there appeared no effect of the prayer or invocation of the prophets upon their sacrifice, Elijah derided them, and bade them call upon their gods with a loud voice, for they might either be on a journey or asleep. And when these prophets had done so from morning till noon, and cut themselves with swords and lances, according to the customs of their country, and he was about to offer his sacrifice, he bade the prophets go away, but bade the people come near and observe what he did, lest he should privately hide fire among the pieces of wood. So, upon the approach of the multitude, he took twelve stones, one for each tribe of the people of the Hebrews, and built an altar with them, and dug a very deep trench. And when he had laid the pieces of wood upon the altar, and upon them had laid the pieces of the sacrifices, he ordered them to fill four barrels with the water of the fountain, and to pour it upon the altar, till it ran over it, and till the trench was filled with the water poured into it. When he had done this, he began to pray to God, and to invocate him to make manifest his power to a people that had already been in an error a long time. Upon which words a fire came on a sudden from heaven, in the sight of the multitude, and fell upon the altar, and consumed the sacrifice, till the very water was set on fire, and the place was become dry. Now when the Israelites saw this, they fell down upon the ground, and worshipped one God, and called him the great and the only true God. But they called the others mere names, framed by the evil and vile opinions of men. So they caught their prophets, and at the command of Elijah slew them. Elijah also said to the king, that he should go to dinner without any further concern, for that in a little time he would see God send them rain. Accordingly Ahab went his way. But Elijah went up to the highest top of Mount Carmel, and sat down upon the ground, and leaned his head upon his knees, and bade his servant go up to a certain elevated place, and look towards the sea, and when he should see a cloud rising anywhere, he should give him notice of it, for till that time the air had been clear. When the servant had gone up, and had said many times that he saw nothing, at the seventh time of his going up, he said that he saw a small black thing in the sky, not larger than a man's foot. When Elijah heard that, he sent to Ahab, and desired him to go away to the city before the rain came down. So he came to the city Jezreel, 
and in a little time the air was all obscured and covered with clouds, and a vehement storm of wind came upon the earth, and with it a great deal of rain. And the prophet was under a divine fury, and ran along with the king's chariot unto Jezreel, a city of Ezar, Issachar. When Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, understood what signs Elijah had wrought, and how he had slain her prophets, she was angry, and sent messengers to him, and by them threatened to kill him, as he had destroyed her prophets. At this Elijah was affrighted, and fled to the city called Beersheba, which is situate at the utmost limits of the country belonging to the tribe of Judah, towards the land of Edom. And there he left his servant, and went away into the desert. He prayed also that he might die, for that he was not better than his father's, nor need he be very desirous to live when they were dead. And he lay and slept under a certain tree, and when somebody awakened him, and he was risen up, he found food set by him and water. So when he had eaten and recovered his strength by that his food, he came to that mountain which is called Sinai, where it is related that Moses received his laws from God, and finding there a certain hollow cave, he entered into it, and continued to make his abode in it. But when a certain voice came to him, but from whence he knew not, and asked him why he was come thither, and had left the city, he said, that because he had slain the prophets of the foreign gods, and had persuaded the people that he alone whom they had worshipped from the beginning was God, he was sought for by the king's wife to be punished for so doing. And when he had heard another voice, telling him that he should come out the next day into the open air, and should thereby know what he was to do, he came out of the cave the next day accordingly, when he both heard an earthquake, and saw the bright splendor of a fire, and after a silence made, a divine voice exhorted him not to be disturbed with the circumstances he was in, for that none of his enemies should have power over him. The voice also commanded him to return home, and to ordain Jehu the son of Nimshi to be king over their own multitude, and Hazael of Damascus to be over the Syrians, and Elisha of the city Abel to be a prophet in his stead, and that of the impious multitude, some should be slain by Hazael, and others by Jehu. So Elijah, upon hearing this charge, returned into the land of the Hebrews. And when he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, plowing, and certain others with him, driving twelve yoke of oxen, he came to him, and cast his own garment upon him. Upon which Elisha began to prophesy presently, and leaving his oxen, he followed Elijah. And when he desired leave to salute his parents, Elijah gave him leave so to do. And when he had taken his leave of them, he followed him, and became the disciple and the servant of Elijah all the days of his life. And thus have I dispatched the affairs in which this prophet was concerned. Now there was one Naboth of the city Ezar, Jezreel, who had a field adjoining to that of the king. The king would have persuaded him to sell him that his field, which lay so near to his own lands, at what price he pleased, that he might join them together and make them one farm. And if he would not accept of money for it, he gave him leave to choose any of his other fields in its stead. But Naboth said he would not do so, but would keep the possession of that land of his own, which he had by inheritance from his father. Upon this the king was grieved, as if he had received an injury, when he could not get another man's possession, and he would neither wash himself nor take any food. And when Jezebel asked him what it was that troubled him, and why he would neither wash himself nor eat either dinner or supper, he related to her the perverseness of Naboth, and how, when he had made use of gentle words to him, and such as were beneath the royal authority, he had been affronted and had not obtained what he desired. However, she persuaded him not to be cast down at this accident, but to leave off his grief and return to the usual care of his body, for that she would take care to have Naboth punished. And she immediately sent letters to the rulers of the Israelites, Jezreelites, in Ahab's name, 
and commanded them to fast, and to assemble a congregation, and to set Naboth at the head of them, because he was of an illustrious family, and to have three bold men ready to bear witness that he had blasphemed God and the king, and then to stone him and slay him in that manner. Accordingly, when Naboth had been thus testified against, as the queen had written to them, that he had blasphemed against God and Ahab the king, she desired him to take possession of Naboth's vineyard on free cost. So Ahab was glad at what had been done, and rose up immediately from the bed whereon he lay to go see Naboth's vineyard. But God had great indignation at it, and sent Elijah the prophet to the field of Naboth to speak to Ahab, and say to him that he had slain the true owner of that field unjustly. And as soon as he came to him, and the king had said that he might do with him what he pleased, for he thought it a reproach to him to be thus caught in his sin, Elijah said that in that very place in which the dead body of Naboth was eaten by dogs, both his own blood and that of his wife's should be shed, and that all his family should perish, because he had been so insolently wicked, and had slain a citizen unjustly, and contrary to the laws of his country. Hereupon Ahab began to be sorry for the things he had done, and to repent of them. And he put on sackcloth, and went barefoot, and would not touch any food. He also confessed his sins, and endeavored thus to appease God. But God said to the prophet that while Ahab was living, he would put off the punishment of his family, because he repented of those insolent crimes he had been guilty of, but that still he would fulfill his threatening under Ahab's son, which message the prophet delivered to the king. End of Book 8, Chapters 12 and 13